Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, I decided to hold a, a briefing today, even although we had not originally planned to have one, because I think it is important to update uh, all of you on recent developments in the northwest of England, and in particular their implications for Scotland, but also to give you an update and some further context to today's statistics in Scotland. Um, I took part in a Four Nations call this morning with the Prime Minister, the First Minister of Wales and the First and Deputy First Ministers of Northern Ireland. Uh, in that call, the Prime Minister updated us on recent developments in the northwest of England and the decisions that the UK government had uh, decided to take as a result. And I very much support uh, the quick action that the UK government took uh, last night. There is no doubt that all of us in each of the nations of the UK are going to face these kinds of challenges in the period that lies ahead of us. We will face uh, clusters and outbreaks, as we have already in Scotland, and possibly we will face more general increases in community transmission of COVID. And it is really important that each of us uh, deals with these issues when they arise, and we do so quickly and effectively. And I want to be very clear today that in Scotland, all of our decisions continue to be informed by, indeed driven by, our clear strategic objective, which is to seek to eliminate COVID. In other words, to drive prevalence of this virus to as low a level as possible and then keep it at a low level. Now, saying that is, uh, of course, easy. Achieving that uh, is not easy and it is going to be difficult and we are going to face challenges in uh, seeking to do that in the weeks and possibly months to come. Uh, we will uh, require ongoing vigilance. Uh, we will require strict adherence by all of us to public health guidance. And of course, it will require a lot of hard work, which is already ongoing on the part of our test and protect teams and indeed our public health teams more widely in every part of the country. And while each of the UK nations will take decisions in line with our own situations, as is our responsibilities, it is also vital that we share data and experiences and that we coordinate our messaging and actions as much as possible and as much as it is appropriate to do so. So I very much appreciate the agreement of all four governments uh, to cooperation and to the sharing of localised information as we work together to suppress this virus and drive it to as low a level as possible. Following on from that call this morning, I chaired a meeting of the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee uh, because I wanted to consider what, if any, actions we needed to take here in Scotland in light of developments in the north of England. The Scottish Government has now issued uh, strong advice against non-essential travel between Scotland and the affected parts of the north of England. And let me be very clear, we don't do this lightly. The connections between Scotland and the north of England are very strong, they are very important and they are highly valued by people on both sides of the border. But we see this as being an important and necessary precaution. Our advice is, of course, designed to minimise the risk of spread from England into Scotland, but it is also designed to assist people in these parts of England. By not travelling there, we are making sure that we don't exacerbate the challenge that they are already facing. We are therefore now advising that travel between Scotland and the areas covered by the UK Government's new restrictions should only be undertaken if absolutely essential. And those areas are Greater Manchester, East Lancashire and parts of West Yorkshire. And you can find details of the specific locations covered by this advice on the Scottish Government's website or on our Twitter feed. Now, if you have already travelled to those areas from Scotland and are there right now, I want to be clear that we're not asking you to cut short your visit. But while you are there, uh, you must follow the UK government's advice and restrictions. And I would ask you to take extra care to follow all of the health advice that is encapsulated in our facts campaign uh, that we have given you throughout the pandemic. And if you are planning to return home to Scotland from these areas, you can, of course, do this. But we're asking that if and when you do so, 
then you are even more careful than normal uh, on your return. I'll ask uh, Jason to comment uh, on this perhaps during the course of this briefing, but in particular, if you're returning to Scotland from these parts of the north of England, we are asking you to minimise uh, your contact with people outside of your own household for 14 days after your return. Uh, and we're asking you to avoid, if at all possible, indoor hospitality and areas where you are more likely to come into contact with people outside of your own uh, household. And of course, if you experience any symptoms or have any cause for concern at all, then you should self-isolate and book a test through the NHS Inform website. Now, I know that some families may have been planning travel between uh, Northwest England and Scotland this weekend, perhaps for a holiday or perhaps, and I know this will uh, apply to many of my own constituents in the south side of Glasgow, to celebrate Eid with family and friends. I'm asking anyone in that position, and I, I repeat, I'm not doing this lightly, uh, but if you are in that position uh, of having planned to travel there over this weekend, unless your travel is absolutely essential. Please, for the reasons I have already given, uh, change those plans uh, and don't travel to those areas. Now, in addition to that travel advice, I also want to say something about uh, the situation here in Scotland at uh, the moment. To do that, I'll start, uh, as is customary, by providing an update on the most recent statistics for Scotland. These, uh, because today's uh, briefing is a bit later than normal, these have already been published today. But I can confirm that an additional 30 positive cases were confirmed yesterday. That represents 0.8% of the people who were newly tested yesterday, and it takes the total number of cases in Scotland now to 18,627. And I'm going to come back and say a bit more about today's cases in a moment. But first, I can also report that a total of 255 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed COVID, which is five fewer than yesterday. And a total of four people last night were in intensive care with confirmed COVID, and that is two more than yesterday. And finally, I'm very pleased to say that during the last 24 hours, yet again, uh, no deaths were registered of a patient confirmed through a test in the previous 28 days or as having COVID-19. And the total number of deaths under this particular measure therefore remains at 2,491. However, that total number of deaths is a reminder of the impact of this virus. And I want to send my condolences again to everyone who is grieving the loss of a loved one. Now, let me return to say just a little bit more about today's cases. Yesterday, when I announced in Parliament the results of a review of lockdown measures, I noted how much progress Scotland has made, and we have, uh, but I also noted how fragile that position is. And that's not a situation unique to Scotland. Uh, all countries are grappling with a very difficult situation in which progress, because of the nature of this virus, is fragile. And today's numbers in Scotland, I think, demonstrate that fact. Uh, in fact, today is the first time we have seen 30 new cases in a single day in more than eight weeks. Now, we must pay attention to that, and I want to assure you that we are paying close attention to that. But of course, it's also important to put it into some context. In early June, when we last reported more than 30 cases, we conducted just over 5,000 tests. Yesterday, we conducted just over 15,000 tests. And today's new cases, uh, and this is important, still represent less than 1% of all those who have been newly tested. And they are also spread over uh, nine of our 14 health board areas. So that's important context, but we shouldn't ignore the fact that we are nevertheless seeing more new cases now than uh, we were seeing two or three weeks ago. We are, of course, closely monitoring all data about new cases and our test and protect teams are working hard to ensure that all potential contacts of all cases are followed up uh, and tested uh, where appropriate. Given all of the information that uh, we have, I want to be clear that our opinion remains that the virus right now is under control in Scotland. But the need for caution is more obvious uh, than it has been probably since the outset of this pandemic, if we are to keep it under control. One particular thing uh, which is striking from data we've seen in recent days that I want to uh, draw particularly to your attention is that around half of all new cases in the past uh, seven days or so have been in the 20 to 39 age group. 
That's something we've seen in other parts of the world recently. Younger age groups, perhaps people more likely to go to pubs and restaurants and meet up with friends, are testing positive in higher numbers. And it is natural after all this time to want to socialise and to catch up with people. But these figures should be a reason uh, for caution. I urge everyone, and particularly people in their 20s and 30s, not to be complacent and to please follow all of the rules. It is there for a very clear and important purpose. We know that fatality rates for COVID are higher amongst older people, but we also know that adults of any age can die from COVID and that adults of any age can transmit COVID to others, including to much more vulnerable older people. And we also know that for anyone, this virus can have serious, harmful and uh, sometimes long-lasting effects. The fact is, nobody, whatever your age or circumstances, nobody can safely get COVID or assume that if they get it, they will not suffer serious consequences. So the best way of protecting yourself, your loved ones and your wider community is to stick rigidly to the Advice in Our Facts campaign. And for those activities which we are now allowed to do, like going to pubs indoors, I'd ask you still to think about how necessary these nights out, nights out are and how frequently you might want to go on them. And remember that the rules on indoor meetings apply in pubs and restaurants as well. You should not be meeting more than two other households inside in a pub or a restaurant and you should be complying with the rules on physical distancing. Now, I mentioned... Eid earlier, and I want to return to that. Uh, firstly, to recognise that today is a very special day for Muslims in Scotland and around the world. And I recognise how important Eid is for all Muslims, and I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you Eid Mubarak. Please enjoy your celebrations. I know how important they are to you, but I urge you to do so safely. There are strict rules on physical distancing in mosques and other places of worship right now. And if you're celebrating at someone else's house, please remember that there should not be more than three households there. And remember also the importance of physical distancing and hygiene. And it is these rules that I want to end on today. What I'm asking all of us, including me, to do right now is to be very conscious of our own behaviour and to think about if and how we can do better in complying with the rules. I will be doing that and I'm asking everyone else to do it as well. Have we maybe just let our standards slip a little bit in the last few days? If that's the case, then this is a moment for all of us to tighten up. Because the fact is this, every single time one of us breaches one of these rules, whether that's going into an enclosed space without a face covering or not washing our hands or not complying, with physical distancing, then we give this virus an opportunity to jump from us to somebody else. And one of the things we know about this virus is that it is very infectious and it will take those opportunities if we give uh, them to it. Uh, and that is important because the virus, as I keep saying, is still there. Uh, just because we can't see it doesn't mean it has gone away. And so everywhere you go, uh, I'm asking you to do this. Everywhere you go, Act as if COVID is in the room with you, because it absolutely could be. And if you think about it in that way, then I think that makes it easier for all of us to remember to act in the ways necessary to stop it jumping from somebody else to you or from you to somebody else. And of course, our facts campaign uh, summarises and encapsulates the five steps all of us can take uh, to try to minimise the risk of transmission. So please, I'm going to end uh, on this point before asking Jason if he wants to say uh, a word more, to remember facts and stick to these golden rules. Face coverings must be worn in shops and public transport and in all enclosed spaces uh, where physical distancing is more difficult. Avoid crowded places. Indoors, obviously, but outdoors as well. Today is a uh, perhaps all too rare hot sunny day in Scotland. Crowded places in parks uh, are not safe. They pose real risks of transmission just as crowded places indoors do. So please avoid crowded places. Clean your hands uh, regularly and thoroughly and clean hard surfaces that you're touching uh, regularly uh, when you touch them uh, as well. Two metre distancing remains the rule and I want to stress that there are limited exemptions in some locations with mitigations. Uh, but generally, two metres distancing is the rule. I suspect it's one of the rules that all of us perhaps are most guilty of forgetting about right now. Please remind yourself of that. And lastly, 
self-isolate and book a test if you have any of the symptoms of COVID. Uh, that is a, a new cough, a fever or a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. You can go to the NHS Inform website and find out how to book a test. If we all remember these five golden rules, and don't just remember them, but make sure we abide by them, then we can't take the risks of an infectious virus away completely, but collectively and individually, we can act to make sure we are minimising the risks of it transmitting from one person to another. So my thanks, as always, for your cooperation. My thanks to those of you who've joined us today uh, for this unscheduled uh, briefing. Um, and uh, I will hand over to Jason now for a few words before we move on to some questions from the media. Jason. Thank you, First Minister. I would only take a moment to underline some of the things you have said. The UK government decided last night that there is a higher risk of transmission of this virus in these pieces of the north of England, and we agree. Let's be very clear, this could be a piece of Scotland, of Wales, of Northern Ireland, and we would respond appropriately wherever that would be. The numbers in England have risen, and therefore the UK government rightly, on the advice of their clinical advisors, has taken these steps. And we have therefore met last night and today with the First Minister to take appropriate steps for Scottish visitors and those who would want to come from those areas to Scotland, and you've heard that we've asked you not to do that. In addition, if you are already there, when you come home, we'd like you to be really careful. That's the summary. We'd like you to avoid contact with other households. We'd like you to avoid hospitality if you possibly can. The reason being, there is a higher risk you will have the virus if you've been there than if you haven't. It is simple as that. You've seen waves, clusters gather around Europe. And again, you've heard from the First Minister and the WHO yesterday that this is increasingly in younger people. And I don't know for sure, but that worries me about indoor hospitality in particular and distancing. And I think perhaps young people have just taken their foot off just a little bit too early. The other thing that they've done in England is they have paused quite a lot of openings that were meant to be happening tomorrow. And we've always said that there is a reverse gear in each country, and there is a reverse gear here. And we will have to not hesitate if that's what's required. That's not the stage we're at, so please don't misunderstand me. We are still comfortable with our control of the virus, but it is very fragile. And then one final uh, step, and that is to say that the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and the Cabinet Secretary for Health and I will be meeting later today with the Muslim faith leaders in Scotland to both express our thanks for everything they've done up to this point, but also to describe in more detail what this guidance means, particularly over this very, very important weekend for that faith group. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, we'll take some questions now. Gordon Cree from STV is uh, first. Thank you. Can I ask you both, do you think the fairer analysis of the, the figures going up a bit in Scotland is that there are more cases, or is it just that we better know who and where they are. And on the, the distancing point you make, it must be quite frustrating for you that so many people don't seem to be following the rules, but they're making judgments themselves because of the, the figures being quite low. How do you square that circle that people don't feel there is a risk? These are really good questions, Gordon. Um, thank you. And Jason will want to, to comment as well. O on the first question, is this a genuine rise in cases or are we just catching more cases because we are undoubtedly doing more testing now? Uh, my uh, non-clinical view of that, uh, but based on all of the information I look at, is that it's possibly a bit of both. Um, I look, and I think I've said this before at the briefing, uh, I, I get presented with these daily statistics every morning. Um, I, you know, for much of the last four months, have looked first at the number of people dying for obvious reasons, and I still look at that because of how important that is. And then I look at the number of cases. Increasingly, uh, in this stage of the pandemic, uh, th one of the first things I'm looking at is the percentage positive uh, case number. So, because that, regardless of all, how many tests we're doing, what is the percentage uh, that is, is testing positive? So today, our 30 cases is 0.8% of 
the newly tested people. Um, and that gives me a degree of assurance uh, because the, the WHO, uh, one of the criteria they set for judging whether the pandemic is under control in countries is that your positivity rate is below 5% over a two week period. Now we are well below that. Um, so, you know, it may be that we are uh, catching more cases. I hope that's the case because that's vital for test and protect. But I don't think we can ignore the fact that we are possibly also seeing a bit of an uptick in cases again. And I, I feel uh, that that is probably the case. And I actually, on the precautionary basis, I'm going to assume that that is the case because I think that means that we're more likely to do all the right things to, to try to, to crack down on that. Um, and on the second part of your question, um, I... I've tried, and it's you know these things are, are never straightforward. And, and part of the reason I still stand here most days to give this briefing is to try to, um, as directly as possible, uh, communicate some of the the difficult balances we're trying to strike. We have made huge, huge progress in suppressing COVID in Scotland. The figures speak for themselves. But the virus hasn't gone away. It is still circulating, and the suppression has been down to lockdown because we have denied at the bridges over which it can cross. As soon as we start to create those bridges again, the risk has always been there that the virus will run out of control again. And I think that is partly what we are seeing in other parts of the world. It might be what we're seeing in England, and it could be what we're starting to see in some respects in Scotland as well. So it, perhaps counterintuitively, physical distancing and all of these other uh, measures that we're asking you to comply with are more important now. When we were basically just telling you to stay at home all day, then telling you to keep physically distant from people in other households wasn't as important because you weren't coming into contact. Now that we're out and about more, if we're going to keep this thing under control, we have to abide by all of this much, much more than has been the case in recent months. And that can be a, a counterintuitive thing when numbers are so low, but it is so important. The, the one thing we know more than anything about this virus is it is very infectious and it will jump across these bridges if we build the bridges for it. So let's not build the bridges. And that's the most important thing that I need to try to get across. Jason. I, I think you're right, First Minister, that it's a mixture of both. The, when that briefing comes in mid-morning, Gordon, the first thing I do is look at uh, the deaths and then I look at the positive cases and then very quickly we look at distribution. So we want to know, is this asymptomatic care home staff testing, of which we're doing tens of thousands a week now? Is it clusters like we've seen in Port Glasgow, because that needs a different type of intervention? Or is it spread in individual cases? Or is it bigger community spread? There is no indication at this point that that's what it is. That's the thing would, that would worry us most. Test and Protect is now managing those 30 cases, and individual days of higher numbers or lower numbers shouldn't be encouraging or discouraging. But I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the days maybe slightly wrong, but Melbourne, Victoria, went from 30 to 300 in about a week. So, so it's very, very easy for this virus to find 300 people. That's not many. So that takes us to your second question, which is how worried are we about people just beginning to relax a little bit? And it's a real balance. You've seen us struggle with that balance standing at these podiums about what, whether we should celebrate and open things up or at the same time saying, please, please be so careful. I mean, the safest public health advice is to all stay at home. That, that's still the safest thing to do. But the economy needs to open. People need to see their families. And, and just now, the balance is right. But it's so, so fragile. Chris Whitty said today at the UK press briefing that he thought England was at the edge of what they could open safely at the edge of what they could open safely. That, that feels like a tricky place for, for us to be. So, that, so that's why we're so cautious. And just, uh, sorry, I, I'll move on to the next question in a moment, but just to give people a bit of added reassurance about how closely we look at these cases, I can already say today, just picking up on something Jason said about looking at distribution of the cases, uh, and it takes a bit of time to really delve into the circumstances of all the cases, but I can already say on the information I've got of the 30, we think 12 are associated with care homes, uh, three are associated with the outbreak in Inverclyde, and we think now there's a total of 13 cases overall associated with that outbreak. So we, we find out as quickly 
quickly as possible as much about all of these cases as we can so that Test and Protect and our public health teams can get on top of breaking the chains of transmission. Now, that shouldn't uh, lead anybody to be complacent, but I hope it gives a bit of assurance that we are on top of all of this uh, as quickly uh, as we need to be to try to do everything we can to prevent onward transmission. Uh, Katrina Renton from BBC. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, you've just said that people who are in affected areas in the northwest of England, that they can, they don't need to return to home early to Scotland, but that they can. If the situation gets worse in the northwest, will you be advising people not to come back until the local lockdowns are over? Uh, um it's a fair question, Katrina, but I'm going to uh, stick with the decisions we have taken and uh, based on the situation as it is and communicate those decisions um, rather than speculate about what we might do if the situation changed. I, I think it's really important that I don't confuse messages by thinking ahead to what I might be advising people in three days or, or a week's time. I hope the situation in these areas doesn't uh, deteriorate and I again I think the UK government uh, has done the right thing in acting quickly and decisively and I'm sure they will be keeping that under review and if they need to impose more restrictions they will do that. So hopefully what they have done will uh, get that under control and, and we won't need to think about any further action for Scotland but if we do need to do that we will and, but when we take those decisions I will uh, set them out uh, at that point. And, and let me also just briefly uh, echo, I, th I think Jason mentioned this and I alluded to it, this is, this is a two-way thing. Uh, the, the travel uh, advice that we're giving people today, yes, it's about trying to protect Scotland. That's my fundamental obligation. But it's actually about trying to help our friends in the northwest of England as well. Because if people from Scotland are travelling there, we're risking making their challenge worse. So this is about solidarity um, as much as anything else. And if there's an outbreak in a part of Scotland um, and... Uh, I, the government in the UK or, or councils in England feel it necessary and appropriate to issue similar advice for people in Scotland, I will understand and respect that. We are all in this together. And, you know, some of the things we have to do, none of us want to be doing it, but it is all in the interest of keeping this deadly virus under control. Is it not risking safety if people are travelling back up? from places that are affected just now. You won't, people won't know who's got it and who's not. Well, that's why uh, we are giving advice to people. So this is not uh, giving people advice to you know, stay in the house absolutely for 14 days when they come back, but to be extra vigilant. So minimise your contact with other people. If you're coming back from one of these areas uh, to Scotland, uh, try as far as possible to stick in your own household group and don't go to the pub or a, or a restaurant for 14 days after you come back. Now. What we consider is the advice that we're giving right now is proportionate. Uh, so it's not an overreaction to a situation in the north of England, but nor is it an underreaction. And if we think over the days to come that we need to do more, we will do that. But what we've announced today we think is precautionary, it's right, and it's based on trying to minimise those risks of transmission. And I should say for, for clarity, obviously I'm... Uh, my responsibilities are for Scotland and my advice to people in Scotland is not to travel to these areas but I'm asking people in these areas not to travel to Scotland either this is a two-way uh, thing and um, I know that the UK government are saying to people in these areas that uh, even if they're outside those areas they should comply with the restrictions about not meeting outside households uh, I'm going a bit further and saying to uh, these people as far as Scotland is concerned please don't travel here while these restrictions are in place and this is all about trying to protect each other. Uh, Rebecca Cook from Global. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, I wanted to speak about the contact tracing app. Scotland's app is being developed using the same software as the Republic of Ireland contact tracing app, already been adapted for use in Northern Ireland and Gibraltar. Why is Scotland further behind on this? Um, I, I don't think we're further behind. I think we're uh, taking steps in the the, the way that we think is appropriate and at the pace we think is appropriate. Remember, uh, back in the earlier days of this pandemic, uh, you will have heard me say, and it's it's actually a, a comment I I stick to very, very strongly, and I'll, I'll come on to say why in a second, is that we didn't want to build Test and Protect around a proximity app. We wanted to build it from the bottom up using our experienced, well-established public health teams uh, to do the uh, the, the shoe leather, person-to-person, on-the-ground contact tracing. And that system 
Uh, as far as we can tell right now, uh, although I'm not complacent about this, is working well. And I think that decision uh, thus far has been vindicated. But we always said if we could have a proximity tracing app as an enhancement to that, and if we were satisfied that privacy concerns could be dealt with and that it would work in harmony with our well-established system, then we would be interested in that. Uh, the UK government's app, uh, for reasons that they have set out, is has not developed as quickly as they, they once uh, hoped. Uh, but we are still talking to the UK government about that and, and are still very interested in that development. The Republic of Ireland, using uh, different software, has an app that is functioning, it seems to me, and from what I'm told very well just now, Northern Ireland is now using that. And we've now uh, entered into an agreement with uh, the, the software company to develop it for Scotland. And we would uh, hope that that would be in use over uh, the, the autumn period. But let me say it's not, it will be an enhancement to what we're doing. It's not a substitute um, and it's never what we wanted to build our test and protect system around. Natasha Reid from Burr. Hi there. Um, Edinburgh Airport's announced redundancies today as a result of COVID, around a third of its 750 workforce. The chief executive says it's partly down to what he describes as an ill-thought-out and unworkable blanket quarantine policy, and also that he's still waiting to find out what can be done to preserve jobs in aviation. Um, so I was just wondering what your response is to that and what support can be offered. Well, firstly, I... I, I deeply regret um, the need for uh, the redundancies that have been announced at Edinburgh Airport today. And, and my thoughts are with the workforce there. My thoughts are with the management there. It is never easy to be in that situation. And I know Gordon Dewar will be feeling uh, the burden of that uh, intensely. And I uh, absolutely uh, understand that. Uh, we will continue to, to seek to support the aviation and the, the wider aerospace sector as, as much as we can. Um, earlier this week, I had a discussion with the Unite Trade Union about some of the issues uh, there and uh, we will work with the UK government to try to do that as well. I, I wish, I'd, more than anything else right now, I, I wish I had a magic wand to take away not just the threat of the virus but all of the implications and consequences of dealing with this virus. I, I don't, um, but we will work patiently and, and as hard as we can with affected sectors to, to do everything we can to try to mitigate that. Um, the Chief Executive of Edinburgh Airport and I, I think we have just an honest disagreement around the need for quarantine and that's, you know, that's fine. I'm not criticising people who take a different view. The biggest risk, or one of the biggest risks, let me not overstate it, we face right now is importation of this virus into the country from other parts of the world. Um, and there's no foolproof way of guarding against that, short of just stopping people coming in at all for any reason. But given the interconnectedness of Scotland with the rest of the UK and, and Europe, that's difficult to do. Uh, so quarantine is the, the best way that we can uh, devise at the moment uh, to reduce the risks of people bringing the virus in and, and then allowing it to spread. I don't want to be in a position of imposing quarantine on people coming into the country. I, uh, Scotland's an open, welcoming country and I can't wait to get back to the time where I, I put an open invitation to everybody to come to Scotland, to, to live, to, to study, to, to travel, to spend uh, your holidays. But right now, we can't, uh, we can't have a risk-free approach that would, would be like that. So quarantine is essential for countries where we deem the risk is higher and we'll continue to take those decisions in a way that is designed to keep the country as safe as possible. And only that you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, people in Manchester on Thursday didn't know their numbers weren't going to go this Thursday as, ha as high as they went. So, so I'm, I'm just nervous about any travel, but, but it, we have to have a really close analysis of all of the data from countries and from bits of Scotland and bits of other countries. So, so you shouldn't be surprised when we then say, this is what the UK government's going to do in Manchester and this is what we're going to say about Spain or hopefully in the next little while say the opposite about Spain. That, as the virus waves, then that, that's the way it's going to have to be. Uh, Katrine Bassey from PA. Good afternoon, First Minister. I wanted to ask today about care homes, which, as you'll know, is a subject that's come up at these briefings quite a lot. Um, the Scottish Conservatives today announced that they have written to the Lord Advocate James Wolfe, raising concerns that the way your government has handled care homes during the pandemic may possibly breach 
public health legislation. And I just wanted your reaction to this, please. Um, I, I haven't seen the, the particular uh, uh, request that uh, the Scottish Conservatives have made. Uh, obviously, any uh, request for the Lord Advocate to act in his uh, capacity as head of the Crown Office, he acts entirely independently of ministers. So it would probably uh, be wise for me not to comment on that because anything I say could be deemed to be trying to influence decisions the Lord Advocate would take uh, entirely independently. So I think it would be for the Lord Advocate to consider any communication he has had from the uh, Scottish Conservatives um, and, and respond directly to them without any uh, influence or intervention from me. Um, more, more broadly, I, I think everybody, whether they agree, disagree or don't have an opinion on the specific actions we took in care homes, I hope everybody will have... Uh, or I hope everybody will accept that not, none of these actions were taken lightly and they were all taken at the time with the best of intentions to try to protect people in, in care homes. And, you know, the, the, the weight of what has happened in care homes and uh, the, the implications of that certainly weigh very heavily on me and, uh, and always will. And I will always try to make sure the government learns lessons and adapts its approach if, if the evidence suggests we need to. And we have done that in, in many respects. Um, in intent, you've asked me about the Scottish Conservatives in particular, and again, people can reach conclusions on whether these things are right or, or wrong, uh, but many of the things we did in care homes uh, were in line with the actions the UK government took in, in England in terms of, because we were worried about COVID in hospitals, both in terms of the capacity in hospitals um, and also not exposing older people in hospitals to COVID when they were medically fit for discharge, uh, trying to get them into to other places, you know, through the uh, Four Nations Agreement on PPE and health and social care, and uh, although some differences, the broad uh, direction of travel around testing, these are all very similar, uh, similar moves. Uh, but we will always look to learn lessons uh, from that. But what I won't do today is uh, tread on the toes of the Lord Advocate in his independent capacity. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Minister, um, you mentioned people coming back to Scotland um, from these areas should minimise contact. I appreciate you've said there's not a need for blanket self-isolating. Could you give a bit more information on what people should not be doing, possibly places they shouldn't be going and so on? And also, uh, I want to ask you about the number of new cases in the 20 to 39 age bracket. Uh, you said people should consider how necessary our nights out are. Um, given this new data, could we see any kind of change of policy in this area from you? I'm not sig signalling a change of policy today. If, if we're going to change policy at any stage, I will say that directly. I won't hint at it. I, I think it's really important that my communication on this is very uh, direct. Um, look, I, I guess this is, uh, and I, I, I always think very carefully about this because I, as far as possible, I like to be clear about do this or don't do that. But there are grey areas in this and, and we uh, pubs are open. Um, subject to lots of mitigation, so people can go to pubs, and I'm not saying absolutely don't go, but there is a need for all of us right now to think about, I suppose, the wisdom of things that we're doing. Just because something is allowed might not mean that we should do it as often as we would have done it pre-COVID. So, you know, for a, a person in their 20s, you know, maybe going to the pub every Friday and Saturday night, not, not for everybody in their 20s, but for some people, uh, that would have been a standard thing to do. What I'm saying is just think about whether that is something you want to do now. So you may maybe go on a Friday night, but not a Saturday night, or you maybe only go once every couple of weeks um, and and minimise more than normal the things you're doing. And, and that does come down, I'm afraid, to individual judgement uh, for, for all of us. But it's just, it's all really about just thinking a bit harder about everything we're doing right now, given uh, what we're facing. And in terms of, uh, Jason might want to say a bit more about the advice to people coming back from the northwest of England. Um, it is about, again, being sensible, trying to minimise the contact with people outside your own household. Obviously, some people will have to be at work and we're not saying you cannot go to work. But, you know, if you've just come back from these areas, then for the next two weeks, don't go to a pub would be my advice. Don't go to a restaurant um, and maybe don't go and visit uh, another branch of your family in their house for a couple of weeks. Again, it's just about taking ultra care that we are not giving this virus a chance to spread. It's, it's awful having to live like this. None of us like it. We're all, you know, fed up with it. I'm fed up with it. 
But this virus hasn't gone away and we must, must, must keep our guard up against it or it will overwhelm us again very quickly. We've learned a lot as a population about risk during, during this pandemic, unfortunately. And, and we've had to make choices as individuals and the government has had to make choices. So tomorrow we make a big change. Tomorrow, shielding is paused. 180,000 people who have been at home for four months now potentially come out of their homes for the first time. If you have been in these areas in the north of England, you are at higher risk of spreading the virus than those who haven't. I can't tell how quite how big that gap is and how much risk you're putting people at, but that's why we're saying you should be more careful. We would do that if it was a piece of Scotland. You've seen us do it with Spain, and now we're doing it with a piece of the north of England. So I would say exactly the same. Don't use hospitality. Don't visit your family. Try and stay just to essential travel and essential journeys and stay within your own household. I, none of that is welcome. I don't want to have to say that. But, but I, I think for our, it's the risk-based approach to the extra risk we now see in the north of England. Thanks. Andy Nicholl from The Sun. No, Andy. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, thank, hi, thank you, First Minister. Um, to today's developments south of the border increase the likelihood of you having to look again at the issue of quarantining people coming in from other parts of the UK. And if so, is there a particular trigger point you would have in mind? For example, this morning, Andy Byrne was saying one of the things that's been the trigger point for the measures down there was the rapid increase in cases per 100,000. So I just wondered, is, is there a sort of tipping point when, when this kind of thing would have to be looked at? Hesitant about giving a, a one-size-fits-all tipping point because we actually look at different uh, bits of data and we will look at bits of data in different circumstances and make judgments. And it would be a lot easier if there was just one single thing, but but there's not, and, and we try to make judgments. Um, and we will be doing that in Scotland, obviously, much more than we're doing it in terms of, of outbreaks in England. But because of the travel implications we and vice versa for the UK government, we have to be mindful of each other's positions. And one of the things we had an agreement around is sharing data so that we understand what's happening in different uh, different parts of the UK. Um, in terms of the, again, you know, the, the quarantine for people coming from England, again, it's this is not necessarily a black and white thing. So what I'm saying today is about restricting travel from England to Scotland and, and Scotland to England in part. So asking people from these affected parts of the north of England not to travel to Scotland and vice versa, and asking people, uh, well, I'm hoping people uh, who live there won't travel to Scotland, but if any of them did, and but particularly to, to Scottish people or Scottish residents who are there and coming home, uh, putting additional, uh, giving additional advice about minimising what they are doing. So that's not a an absolutely blanket quarantine policy, but it is about additional restrictions. And all of these things are on a bit of a spectrum, I, I suppose. And, you know, if the situation gets more serious uh, and deteriorates, then we would perhaps go further along that spectrum. But we try to be proportionate and we try to be targeted and we try not to restrict people any more than we have to, but make sure that we're not underreacting uh, to these situations. Uh, Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, the government's been very quick to impose quarantine, um, like strict quarantine at short notice on people from Spain uh, last weekend or, or people from Luxembourg yesterday. So I just wondered if you could say a bit more about why, why, you've, uh, why you've stopped short of that in the case of, the, of North West England. Is that based on an analysis of case numbers or, or some data? Or is it that... That you're treating this as a, a sort of special case because it's also part of the UK? It's, it's not straightforwardly any of these things, but I guess a bit of all of these things, if, if, if you get my drift. Um, we, we look closely at case numbers and there is a, a significant risk of importation from uh, parts of the north of England right now. Um, and that's why we are not doing nothing about that. We are giving very strong advice to minimise those risks. But... 
we equally have to recognise the context in which we're operating, which when we're talking about England is different to when we're talking about Spain. And, and that's not just because obviously England is our closest neighbour, um, but it's about the practical ways in which people travel. So if somebody flies in from Spain right now, uh, we gather their information uh, before they come here. They've got the advice to quarantine and Public Health Scotland can, uh, on a sample basis, check up uh, to, to see whether they're complying with that or not. Clearly, the way people travel from England to Scotland is very different. So the practical considerations of uh, having a system like that for England into Scotland travel or Scotland into England travel is, is different. It doesn't mean there's no practical things that we can and will, if necessary, consider. But we have to just recognise that the, the context is different and none of us can... None of us exist out with the realities uh, of life uh, as we know it. So we, we, we try to be proportionate in terms of the quantification of the risk in all uh, cases, but we also try to adapt the solutions to the particular circumstances in which we're operating. But, you know, if, if I, and I've said this all along, and I've also said all along that there is nothing political or constitutional about it, at any stage, if I think we need to do it uh, to take stronger action to reduce that risk of... It spread from England to Scotland, we will do that. And there will be practical challenges around it. I, I make no bones about that, but we will seek to do that if we think it is necessary. Do you want to say I'm anyone? sure you use two ex extreme examples maybe to make the point. If, if the First Minister asks for public health advice on Brazil, it's pretty straightforward. The, the, the difference between Brazil's infection and our infection is so stark that every public, public health advisor in the world would say, don't let people from Brazil come. If the First Minister asks for public health advice on New Zealand... It's pretty straightforward. There's almost no infection in New Zealand and the gradient is the other way. So we, bringing New Zealanders in is no risk. Everything in the middle is difficult. Everything that's close to us and in that middle group and grey is harder to give advice about. So we do our best to analyse outbreaks, reactions to outbreaks, how well a country is managing them and raw numbers, prevalence, incidence and individual death rates and prevalence at that moment in time. Uh, David Ball from the Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, given the situation in the northwest of England and the fact, for example, that southwest England has an R value above one as well, um, should Scots be thinking twice before travelling to any part of the UK that has a, a higher prevalence of the virus than Scotland? Well, I say a couple of things about that, but Jason uh, may want to say more and, and should feel free to correct me if I get any of what I'm about to say wrong, because I'm, I'm steering into to technical uh, grounds here. I would, uh, you, you've heard me for much of the last four months talk about the R number, um, and I'm not saying it's suddenly not important, but actually as we get to levels of prevalence right now uh, that we're at very low, the R number becomes much, much less reliable in judging the, the state of infection in any particular area. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay... I pay more attention to case numbers and, and the direction of travel of them than I would to the, the R number. Um, if we are giving specific travel advice, as we are doing today in relation to the northwest of England, we will do that. And, and I want to be very clear about that. Uh, and we are giving very clear, very strong, very unequivocal uh, travel advice about the northwest of England. Uh, we're not doing that right now about other parts of England. If the situation changes, we may in future, and, and I will tell you about it. More generally, and I've made this comment a few times in the last couple of weeks about foreign travel, um, I, I would advise against non-essential foreign travel right now because the situation overseas is unpredictable and, and volatile, uh, as it is at home. Um, and I suppose for the same reason, I would, I would ask people, I'm not asking people not to travel to, to parts of England outside the parts we're asking you not to travel to at the moment, but I would just be a bit more thoughtful about anything you're doing right now, uh, about travelling, about going out to a pub or a restaurant, just everything you're doing right now, be a bit more thoughtful about it. And that, that doesn't equate in every circumstance to saying don't do it. You know, and again, it's one of these things where we're trying hard to get the right balance. I desperately want people to support our tourist industry. I desperately want people to support our retail industry and our hospitality industry. They've had a torrid, horrible time and they need our support. So I'm not saying don't do these things. I'm saying just think about it and think about how you're doing it and how often you're doing it and the precautions you take when you do. Um, and if we all do that, then we just minimise the risk of this thing overpowering us again. I, I would concur that we're not changing the travel advice for anywhere else across the UK but 
you might want to take the facts poster with you and stick it on the door of your self-catering accommodation. Because wherever you are, you should still follow the face coverings, the avoid crowded places, the clean the surfaces, the keep two meters apart, and self-isolate if you have symptoms. So the world is not normal. It's not normal in the southwest of England, and it's not normal in Dundee. So wherever you are, and wherever you choose to visit family or to vacation, you should follow the advice that you all know so, so well. So that's why you can travel to the southwest of England, even though there may be virus there, and you can travel in Scotland, and there may be virus there. You've, you've got to think about that risk wherever you are and follow the rules and avoid the virus getting chains of transmission. That's how it goes from 30 to 300 so fast. My plea is take facts with you wherever you go. In your head all the time, just be constantly asking yourself if you're complying with all of that. And if you want to take a few posters and stick them up elsewhere... You have to uh, my that is, uh, 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 Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to encourage people to go to England by saying that it's a way to escape Jason Leach on the television. I wouldn't want ever uh, to but say that. Is. I'm going to move on to the next question now before I get into trouble. Uh, Connor Marlborough from The Scotsman is the last question today. Uh, afternoon, First Minister. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, your uh, view on the way Matt Hancock uh, announced the lockdown for the north of England or the northwest of England. Um, it was after 9 p.m. Uh, he's been criticised by uh, the SNP in Westminster and by Labour. And I just wondered, obviously, you have an interest in the safety and, uh, of, of Scott in the northwest at the moment. Was it the right way for him to do it? And would you in future, if there were outbreaks like that uh, in Scotland, would you do it the same way? I, as First Minister, I'm not going to um, you know, comment on other uh, government leaders, you know, whether that's the Prime Minister, or in this case, the, the English Health Secretary's handling of these things, because I don't have all the, the, the information that they would have had last night. I don't know when they got that information and, and therefore what the, the, the timing and the, uh, the uh, chain of events was after that. And also, and, and this is perhaps the most... Uh, more relevant point. I know how difficult, from my own experience, these decisions are. These are agonising decisions for anybody in a position like mine. And I know living with the consequences of these decisions is more agonising for everybody out there. But these are some of the toughest decisions, not some of the toughest decisions. These are the toughest decisions I've ever had to take in uh, the whole time I've been in government. So it's not easy and it's really difficult to get the balance right and mistakes will be made and Communication of some of this is, is really difficult. So, you know, we're all, I think, trying to do our best. What I do think, and, you know, we, we sort of reflected on this in the call earlier today, is that we can all learn from each other around this. I, I think we will, in Scotland, want to learn from the experience in the northwest of England over the last 24 hours to, to see if we can learn from what they, they did well there and also perhaps learn from uh, the things that, that we could perhaps do better. And, and they will hopefully learn from us and the things we do well and also the things we get wrong and they can hope to avoid as well. So none of this is easy. And I suppose that's the, the key thing I would just ask people to remember. We're, we're not dealing with an exact science here. We're, we're not dealing with something that you can predict with any certainty what's going to happen. And we're also dealing with a situation where speed of response is... Is, is important because this virus can get out of control very quickly. So all of that, you take all of that into account and it's not surprising that people like me will not always get this 100% right. And it's really important that we recognise that and also try to learn as we go on all aspects of this. Uh, that concludes the questions from today. Uh, so can I thank the journalists uh, for joining us today, again at short notice, uh, because this, this briefing wasn't originally scheduled. Uh, thank Jason uh, and Yvonne, uh, who definitely stepped in at short notice to be our BSL interpreter today. I'm very grateful for that, because it's important that all of these briefings are accessible to everybody across the country. And thank those of you who've managed to join us today. Um, we are you know, living, and we will for possibly quite some time to come, be living in a, an unpredictable and volatile situation where things will change at short notice, where our advice might change and our policy decisions might have to change. And you know, we, we will try to communicate that as, as straightforwardly and as directly and as clearly as we possibly can. But I suppose I'd ask you to bear with us a little bit because of the uncertainties and the, 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 the quick uh, changing nature of what it is that, that we are dealing with. But to remind you, uh, I suppose to end, by, by saying again that we have made so much progress, but we are surrounded right now, uh, here in Scotland, in England, across Europe, the world, we are surrounded by warnings that tell us 
what I've been trying to tell everybody for some time now, that this virus hasn't gone away. It's still out there. It's still infectious. It's still dangerous. And it's still, in many cases, sadly, deadly. So we cannot drop our guard against it. We absolutely ignore these warnings at our peril. So I am appealing to everybody, uh, to those of you watching, and I'm asking those of you watching to, to pass this message on to everybody you know that might not be watching. Please remember facts in everything you do right now. Follow these golden rules so that collectively we can keep this thing under control. Face coverings in enclosed spaces. Uh, avoid crowded places, whether they're outdoors or indoors. Clean your hands, uh, particularly when you first go to a place or, or when you leave a place and regularly in between. When you touch a hard surface, make sure you clean it so that somebody else is not picking the virus up off that if you have left it there. Two metres distancing. Every time you're with somebody in a different household, I ask you to stop and think about the distance between you and the other person. Uh, and if you've got other households in your own home, remember you have to keep physically distance. And uh, also remember, if you have any of the symptoms of this virus, immediately self-isolate and book a test. Don't wait to see if the symptoms get better. Act immediately. Speed of action for government is important here, but speed of action on the part of all of us is really important. And finally, um, coming back to the, the key point of today's briefing, please do not travel uh, to the affected areas in the northwest of England. You can find more detail of the specific locations in Greater uh, Manchester, West Yorkshire and Lancashire that we're asking you not to travel to. And if you're in one of those areas and coming back to Scotland, please follow the advice we've given you. Minimise contact for 14 days outside your own household. Don't go to pubs and restaurants um, and don't visit your family elsewhere. Uh, let's keep our guard up against this virus so that we keep seeing the progress that we have collectively made in these last few months. My thanks to all of you. I will be back at the usual time on Monday at 12.15. In the meantime, have a, a good weekend, but most importantly of all, please have a safe, facts-driven weekend. Thank you very much.